Hi, this is Tom, guitar player for Private Fear, Sinner and Rock Meets Classic, and you're listening to Sonic Perspectives. Hey everyone, this is Gonzo with Sonic Perspectives, and today we are being joined by a guy who loves playing in Primal Fear so much, he can't stop coming back. Mr. Tom Nauman, how kind of you to join us today. Hello guys, how are you? So, like, you've been in and out of Primal Fear since the band started, but but this time around, uh, you didn't replace anybody when we rejoined them, and, and now you're a three-guitar band. Uh, not really, because um, Magnus, he's doing the, the studio duties and he's writing songs and producing the albums or kind of producing the albums together with Matt. And he writes a lot of songs, but um, because of family issues, he cannot go out on tour. So that's why Alex and me are taking the duties to play live and makes your ears bleed. Oh. <laughs> Oh, okay. I didn't realize that, but uh, but when you guys record, it's three guitar players yes. playing all the parts. Is that correct? Yes. Not like playing all the parts because everybody's playing a special kind of parts, and if you go to the playing the lead guitar, so we split up the solo, so everything will be will be nice and well organized. Okay. Uh, how exactly do you split up the parts then? Like, does it does one guy do all the rhythm parts and? You know, and what about all the harmonies and stuff? Most, most of the time, Magnus does a lot of, of rhythm parts. But um, when when Alex and me are writing songs, I got some ideas. We also record that stuff. Oh, okay. Well, that sounds nice and simple. Yeah, it's cool. I can live with that. You know, like I also would love to to be in the studio as a band and and like to hang out and to to record together and to discuss things and. But nowadays, it's sometimes a little bit difficult because we have a drummer coming from Italy. We got. Three guys living around Stuttgart, and we got another guy who lives in France, and then we got the Magnus lives in Sweden. So it's pretty tough to bring them all together in a rehearsal room and and all that stuff. So it's nowadays it's just like normal. You have your own studio at home, and then you write your own ideas and your own songs, and then we got a Dropbox where we put in all our ideas, and then we can work together on some special kind of stuff. And so and sometimes I got a riff, and then I send a riff to Matt, and Matt says out. Oh, that's quite good to come over because I just live like six or eight miles away from Matt and so and we got the same hobbies and all the stuff so we in, we are in contact very often and so sometimes we go like yeah I will come over on Saturday then we can work on a song then we watch soccer together and have a beer and all that stuff so that's pretty a relaxed kind of work. Okay, so I didn't realize that you guys were doing all your recording long distance. Like, I remember 15 years ago, Arion did that, and it was like a weird new thing to record uh, internationally like that. And now it seems like everybody's doing it. Yeah, it's, but it's but when we go into the studio, we, 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 we record the drums live. Mm -hmm. So we're using drum computer stuff. We record the drums live, and then everybody's working at home and on his parts and that's the normal way it, it goes it's it's like times are changing you know like when 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 we started prime of fear we were all in the studio and we we hang out for three or four weeks to record an album together but you sold a lot of copies way back then and uh, you get a lot of money from the record company so you can afford to to rent a studio for that kind of period uh, nowadays, as you probably might know, the, the record sales are going down the drain for because of MP3 and Spotify and all that other stuff. And so the record companies don't, don't have so much money anymore. And so they give you maybe just a half of what we got a couple of years ago for recording an album. But the fans would like to have the, the same quality and all that stuff. So you have to decide if you go into a studio to have the band feeling and maybe you have a shitty album out because it's not well played or well produced or well recorded or well mixed and mastered. Or you just do it at home. You save some money because you have your studio by your own. You don't have to rent anything. And then you can spend more time in, in, in uh, recording and in mixing and mastering to get the, the same sound and, and everything else that you got from the last albums you released. 
And, you know, speaking of the sound, I mean, I was listening to Apocalypse just a moment ago. It sounds fantastic. I never would have thought that it was pieced together th- this way. It sounds like it sounds like a lie, like a very, very well rehearsed band in the studio, the old fashioned yeah. way. But we are a really well prepared and well rehearsed band because we play a lot of shows live. Mm-hmm. And we just started like last week. I think we were last week we played in Italy and we played in uh, next to our hometown at the Bangor Head Festival. And so we played the Hounds of Justice for the very first time for in front of a live crowd. And uh, it really turned out to be to be a great song and to, to be a really a cool rocker. And uh, the fans really loved it and it was fun to play. And it, we were after the show, we looked at each other and we go like, it sounded like we played the songs for three or four years. It was really like, wow. It was really well played and very tight, and it was pretty fun to play that song live. It, I'm sure it also helps that you guys have been playing together for over 20 years now. Yeah, sure, because Alex and I, we know exactly what the other guy is doing, and uh, it's like uh, we have a really good relationship off stage and on stage, and we're really not... Uh, you know, when when we were kids, when we were like, we played together when we were like twenty or twenty five, like we have our regular normal fights. Who gets into the limelight playing guitar solos and all that stuff? <laughs> but now we are getting older and we are wiser and more relaxed. And we go like, ah, come on, just do you do the solo or do this or do that. And so it's not not like a competition anymore. It's just like a healthy competition. But um, it's more like helping the other guy and having fun on stage without having the feel of that's a competition. I have to be better than this guy or whatever. So it's more like let's do this shit together and it sounds fantastic. You know, it was really funny to hear you say that you guys are more relaxed now because because Apocalypse is not easy listening. <laughs> like, like, it's driving music. Like, it's it's stuff that makes me want to go really, really fast in my car, and I will probably get pulled over for speeding while I listen to it. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, yeah, but then we have two ballads on the album. <laughs> that, yeah, but those are heavy, too. Oh, okay, they're heavy, but they're ballads, so that's like more slow in slower songs. I'll, I'll time it so that I'm passing through a residential area during those songs. Okay, and we got we got some uh, we got some mid tempo rockers and groovy stuff, and okay, we have also got like some double bass tracks and really fast song like New Rise, like the opener of the album. Well, what's the uh, what's the songwriting process for you guys? Like, how do you how do you make this stuff come to life? Um, like in, in the beginning, we just uh, try to to collect ideas, just to get just to hang around. When I'm on my terrace with a but even with an acoustic guitar, then you got a melody or you got a riff. And I recorded on my iPhone. And then later I go down into my studio and I go like, oh, I got like several ideas. And then I start to record it to find out the, the tempo and all the stuff. And then I start to, to record it. And even if it's just a riff, I put it in, the, in, in a Dropbox. We got a Prime and Fiat Dropbox and everybody can put his ideas in there and then we can work with this idea or that idea and then we did the final song and then we decide which songs will be on the album then the album got released or will be released it's in august and then we will make up our minds which songs we will play live and then we to to rehearse maybe five six seven songs of the album and then we will decide which songs are playable and which songs are really played well and which songs are too heavy to play or they do not sound great or good enough and then we have to skip them so that's our final decision when we are in the rehearsal room and we play our songs you know we were talking guitars just a moment ago and the primal feel rhythm guitar tone is one of the most wicked guitar tones i have ever heard Oh, thank you. Yeah, and and some of our readers have been asking about what kind of gear you use to to make those sounds, like heads and cabs and pickups and stuff. Well, what do what do you guys use to make these albums sound so good? Besides your own fingers and ears. Um, I'm not sure, but I think probably uh, Magnus plays a camper, and uh, I'm I'm also playing a camper, but uh, I'm using angle profiles and I think that Marcus also 
uh, uses angle profiles for all the rhythm and the lead stuff. And uh, Alex is playing Marshall. He's the analog guy. Alex is the analog guy, and he he hates Camber. <laughs> he hates Camber because every time when we are when we are on tour and we play like South America, and I take my Camber with me all the time in a small rack with my wireless system, and he's always got rental gear, rental Marshalls, and when you play South America, half of the gear doesn't really work, and so and he's kind of envy because everywhere we go and my gear arrives there. I do have the same sound everywhere on, on the world, and sometimes he has like bad luck and gets some destroyed marsh lamps. <laughs> oh, there is something kind of romantic about doing it the old fashioned way, though, isn't there? Yeah, but to be honest, I, I love when, when I was like, when we did the first Prime and Fear stuff, I played, played Angle Savage till 2013, and I still love to play it. But then I got member of the Rock Meets Classic family and you play with different musicians and you have a three hour show with 30 songs and you got like, we had Steve Walsh of Kansas and we got Scott Gorham from Thin Lizzy and, and this got and Pete Lincoln from the Swede and we got Dan McCavity of Nazareth and Joey Tappets from Europe. And so you need different kind of sounds for every musician or for every band. And that's why I bought a camera because there are so many sounds in it, and they really they sound cool, and everything is fine, and it's really easy to handle and easy to work with. You know, I want to take a break to talk about Rock Meets Classic right now, and then we'll get back to Primal Fear because, like, I didn't realize that you were in Rock Meets Classic, and not all of our readers know what that is. Could you tell us a little bit about that and about your involvement? Um, it's Rock Meets Classic is a is a brand in in Germany that lasts for. A, like nine years, and we will have a the tenth anniversary in two thousand nineteen. And um, this year was my 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 third time that I, I did this rock Meets classic stuff. And it's like you have a, an orchestra. We have a like a sixty piece orchestra with all the violins and everything. What's what's uh, what you need for having a good orchestra? And then you have a rock band, and for example, Alex of Primafia is involved, Matt is involved, and he's the musical director, and I'm involved, and um, then we got original musicians and original singers, and uh, we played our songs. For example, this last year we got Steve Lukather of Toto, and you play Rosanna and Africa, and then we got Don Felder, and you play Life in the Fast Lane, you play Hotel California, we also had Doro, we had Joey Tempest of Europe, we got Francis Rossi, Ian Gillen, Alice Cooper, and um, it's like a three-hour show, and we got uh, every every artist or guest artist uh, will play like four or five songs, and it's a, it's a perfect combination to, to have the opportunity and possibility to share the stage with a great rock musician, rock musicians, a great personalities and lovely and nice people who influenced your life way back when you were young. Please bring that to the United States. Please. That sounds incredible. It's, it's really fucking incredible. So last, next year we will have like Ian Gillen. We'll play a lot of Deep Purple stuff. Then we have uh, Kevin Cronin from Aria Speedwagon. We have the Mike Reno of Loverboy. We have uh, the Swede, and there are final negotiations with, I guess, the Lizzie. And for me, it's like a dream come true because the Lizzie was there when I did my first Rock Meets Classic, and to have the opportunity to be on stage with one of the the guitar players who influenced my life, it's a fucking amazing thing. It's like wow, a dream came true. You're like be on stage and play Rosalie and and all that stuff and, and Jailbreak. It's like, wow, amazing stuff. Wow. It's like living your schoolboy dreams doing that. I did that last year because when I was young, I was really into Rick Springfield's music. I loved the Living in Us album and, and all that stuff. I really liked his stuff and I dressed like him and I was like, wow. <laughs> and then Matt came on and said, yeah, next year we'll have Rick Springfield. And I go like to Alex, like, Matt, you can, Alex, you can do whatever you want, but I play every fucking solo on this Rick Springfield tunes, and we play "Love Somebody" and "Celebrate Youth" and um, "Jesse's Girl," and 
that was really, really fantastic experience for me. Also to play, to hang out with Steve Lukather and play his songs. It's like a dream came true. And this year we played uh, in Frankfurt, and there was the music fairies and uh, Jeff Jeff Waters of NLA. He he, he came by and he saw the show, and he was like, "Tom, what the fuck is this? It's the most amazing thing <laughs> that I ever saw in my fucking whole life." And he was like, "Wow, that was cool." And it's really fun, you know, like playing playing their songs and then have the opportunity to hang out with them uh, at the hotel bar and just to say, can you tell me something about Phil Linnett or can you tell me something about Don Henley or stuff like that? And, and they go like, yeah, sure, let's have a drink and I tell you something about Phil Linnett or whatever and you, or you have a regular conversation or like this year we had Jesse Greenberg who played for for Super Tramp and his father was the original drummer and there are so many funny stories and um, to tell and we got Eric Bersern of the Hooters and he brought his mandolin at the hotel bar and we're hanging at the hotel bar closing at two o'clock but we were still hanging there till five o'clock singing Beatles songs. <laughs> Amazing experience. It's like wow it's a dream come true and you know the fun part is like now I have the mobile, the, 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 the phone number of Steve Lukather and Mike <laughs> Settler of Saga, he's writing me every week and I got in touch with every person of the Hooters and we're just writing on Facebook and it's amazing stuff. It's really fun to play those songs. Wow, I could listen to your Rock Meets Classic stories all night, but I know it's late over there in Germany, so let's go on and get back to the Primal Fear stuff. By the way, when I said bring that to the United States, I wasn't joking. That sounds like something that would need to be seen to be believed. Yeah, the problem is like we have like we got everything. We got like we got the lights, we got the the whole show, we got the stages, we got the the orchestra, and it's like there was like around hundred people traveling every fucking day. And if you go to America, you have to to buy flight tickets for hundred people. It's a expensive thing to 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 do. And then yeah. you have to do shows, and you still need a lot of money because if there are hundred persons working. They all need to have hotel rooms, they need food, they need everything. And if you do it for the first time in America, you don't know what to expect. Normally you need like two and a half, three thousand people to have a break even. Well, we can keep dreaming then. Um, maybe there is some crazy, crazy guy over there and said, I would like to have it and I will bring it over there. Ah, well, I'll see if I can talk to the right people. Yeah. So, Primal Fear has a new album coming out very soon. It's called, yes. it's called Apocalypse. It's yes. sick. And there's a lot of harmonized riffs. There's a lot of harmonized solos. There's a lot of harmonized melodies on the new record. How you manage to stand out uh, among all the other bands. Because like this is something that you guys have been doing for a while. And Primal Fear is one of those bands that, that helped bring this style of metal back to life in the late nineties, but now there's so many other bands doing it. Do you guys do anything consciously to stand out from the crowd? No, not really. Because I, as we started the band, we were just, as a, I met Ralph and Matt and we just sat there and we go like, guys, you know, we live in the same city. So let's meet up once in a while and write a couple of cool tunes together. And we just started to write songs and we never, thought about that Prime of Fear would be successful in any kind of way, especially in 1996, 1997, where the grunge scene was ruling the world and heavy metal was totally off the radar. And we just wrote songs for because we just had fun and then we recorded a demo and then we got a record deal in Japan and then we got a deal in, in Germany and then the album came out and we got successful. And uh, then everybody started like, this is the album that Judas Priest had to release after the Painkiller album. And so we got we got uh, compared to, to, to Judas Priest just because of Ralph has a similar voice than Rob Halford. But we never thought that we like sound like Judas Priest clowns. We just try to write our own stuff and we have our own quality and our own way to write melodies and way to, to, to write songs. And we always try to improve our, our skills in, in writing songs or playing solos or creating something new or something different. And I do not look to, I don't care, 
Iron Maiden or Iced Earth or to accept or whatever. It's just I, I sit in my studio and I start to play the guitar. And if I like this riff, I record that riff. If I don't like it, I skip it. And maybe someone else would go like, oh, that is a fucking riff and you skipped it. So, yeah, because I don't like it. So every, everybody of us has his own style of writing songs or to bring in special kind of melodies or to make it interesting. And we always try to 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 improve ourselves. Like, I don't want to record the same album year after year after year. And then we always try to, to push it a little bit further. Like we cannot we cannot lose our roots. We have to stick to our roots. But we just want to don't want to do the same stuff over again and over again and over again. So we just want to be a little bit different. And that is maybe also a point that keeps us healthy in our minds in writing songs or improve in to improve in ourselves in doing different kinds of stuff. So what are your favorite moments on the album? That depends on my mood, to be honest. So Okay, angry mood. What's your fa- favorite moment when you're angry? I love to rise. It's like a really a, a great song for me. I love the beast. It's also great. The ritual is a, is a cool track. And when I'm in a, in a more relaxed mood, I, I go into Eye of the Storm. So we got a lot of different kind of, of songs on the album. We got really like New Rise is a really fast, like sort of trashy fast song. Then we got a lot of groove songs and, and, and slow double bass songs. We got ballads, we got rockers, we got metal tunes. So I think we got a really good album with different kind of music and songs on it. Are there any moments on the album that were particularly difficult for you guys to make happen? Mm, no, I don't think so. Sometimes it just like takes some time to figure out how it can work. Because if you got an idea, and now I'm closing my eyes at the moment just to get, I would like, it has to sound like this or it has to sound like that. That's the most difficult part to get on tape or to get on the on your disc what you hear in your mind. And if you get close to it, then everything is fine. So that's, I think that's the most uh, difficult part to get all the stuff that you got in your mind when you, re- when you write a song and then you record a song just to get it exactly on, on tape or on the record then you got it in your mind. And that's the most yeah, difficult stuff. But when it comes to record all that stuff then and you got everything in, set up in your mind and you know exactly how it has to sound, then it's, it's easy then because then you try to let your fingers speak as good as you can. Or in in Ralph's case, his voice speaks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to tell you that I I I didn't really know what to expect from the new Primal Fear album, but I am really really enjoying it. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's it's very good stuff. I mean, like you know, you, you guys, you know, decided what you guys wanted to do uh, and how you wanted Primal Fear to sound early on, and you've stuck with that with with remarkable dedication. But it never gets old. Like, you guys still sound young and alive, and, like, you're having the time of your life every time I put in a Primal Fear CD. Yeah, but uh, as I told you, I have fun doing this shit. And when, when, you have, when you're having fun and you're really into it and we all have fun and we're having a lot of fun when we hang out together when we're on tour and or when we play festivals, there's a lot of love and everything. And it's, we got a very positive vibe in the band. And I think if you, got, if you are positive, then you will... He, kind of hear it on an album. And we don't want to lose our roots, as I told you before. We want to stick to what it's all about, about Prime and Fear. But we always want to improve ourselves without losing our roots. And that's the, that's a tricky stuff to do, but I'm not sure if, if, if our fans would love if we would make like a, a grunge album or a core album, so we rather stick to get what we, what we love and what we like and what we can play. <laughs> now you mentioned a moment ago that when you first started Primal Fear with Matt and uh, and Ralph, Matt had been playing in Sinner since like the early '80s. Uh, yes. Ralph had been in Gamma Ray already. What was yes. your background at that point? I was playing in Sinner since 1988. Oh, so, for that long? Yeah, I, I tried. I got I got in my old band, and uh, we were popular in here in the era. And then we we made we made a demo and. Uh, Matt recorded the demo and he loved one song on the on, on the demo and he asked me if he could put it on a Sinner album and so he, 
I agreed. And then I think one year later, he asked me if I would like to join Sinner and to go on tour. And since then, we, we hang out together and we have fun. And 1996, when uh, Ralph was uh, got the chance to, to be the new singer of Judas Priest, he formed a band called Just Priest, who was playing like a Judas Priest tribute band. Mm-hmm. And then they had a show. And uh, the drummer, who was also a good friend of mine, he called me one day and asked me if I could join just priest for a show in their hometown because their original guitar player has a marriage on that day. And so <laughs> I was a I was a huge Judas Priest fan because originally I started because of Glenn Tipton of Judas Priest. He gave me five on the show when I when I saw them way back in nineteen eighty one at the point of entry tour. Wow. So I was a huge Judas Priest fan way back then. And so it was easy for me to, to join the, the tribute band and then the drummer called me again a couple of days later and asking me, do you know a bass player? Because our bass player is the best friend of our guitar player. So he's going to be on the, on the wedding as well. Hmm. And I go, like, oh, I can ask Matt. And then we rehearsed together this prime, uh, this uh, two street tunes. And then Ralph, Matt and I, we sat together. We're like, hey, we live in the same city. Let's write songs together. Hmm. And so it all started to, to, just to just writing songs and we never, to be honest, we never thought to be that successful. Or we just had fun writing songs. It was like 1997, and there were like a lot of guys with uh, strange haircuts and beards on MTV and singing strange songs for us called Grunge. And it wasn't our time. And then I think that Hammerfall released a, a, tr- a true metal album, and they got really popular in Germany. And mm-hmm. just like two months after that, we released our album. and it went into the charts and it was like all of a sudden we went we played every huge festival in Europe and we were really big by that time. It was really an awesome experience to make. Aren't you glad you did it? Yes, it was fun. <laughs> and it's, to be honest, it's still fun. Like we played Hellfest, you can see Iron Maiden and we played last week we played in, in Italy with our Chuff Tate who's doing his Green Strike stuff. So it's great huh. to we meet a lot of guys, you know, like, oh, we play with Accept, and they, they come along, they go, hey, Tom, how are you doing? And we're like, what the fuck, how do you know my name? I was a fan, and they're like, now, now they're sitting next to me, and go like, hey, I'll bring you a beer if you want one. And it's fucking amazing, and then you start to, to realize that you belong to this metal music community, which really gives me shivers all the time, like, when we played Hellfest and there was like Arch Enemy was on stage and I was having a drink and I went outside and having a smoke with my backliner and then Michael Emmett came and he saw me like 30 meters away and he was like, hey Tom, great to see you, how are you doing? And I go like, Michael Emmett, the great guitar player of Arch, Arch Enemy, he knows me and he's talking to me, it was like amazing shit, you know? And it's just fun to hang out with, with all those guys and, and, and having fun at that festival to see a lot of bands. and That's pure fun and I really enjoy it. I, I, I live my dream because when I was young, I always wanted to be a rock star. And then I turned my hobby into a living and I'm living it. And that's why I enjoy every day of my life when I can do this kind of music, except when I have to hang out on the airport for too long because the flight got canceled. <laughs> <laughs> wow, man! What you know? That's a great place to be, man. I'm really happy for you. I, I really appreciate this. So I have one last question for you. So Matt and Francesco are also in Sinner. Yes. Uh, in fact, Primal Fear and Sinner have five guys in common that I know of, mm-hmm. and and both bands have remained very active over the years. Do yes. You ever, do you ever get confused who you're playing with? Uh, not really, to be honest, <laughs> because I know most of the guys already for a couple of years. And, you know, like, I I played in Sydney from 1998 till 1997, and then I rejoined, and then now I'm back again. And it's just like we played a festival just three weeks ago. It was just, just like pure fun to be on stage and, and rock this shit out. It's just like, wow. And it's more like, yeah, we just take it, we take it easy. We're not too serious about ourselves. We just... Go out having a good time and try to make the crowd enjoy our kind of music. Well, 
Uh, Tom, it's been a pleasure talking to you, man. Thank you so much. I am looking forward to seeing you guys on the road very, very soon. That would be nice, yeah? Then we can have some lukewarm Heineken or Budweiser. <laughs> or whatever other garbage we drink here. I hope to see you soon somewhere on, on, on tour in America. Or maybe you have the possibility to come over to visit some of the great metal festivals in Germany or in Europe. You know, I've only seen Primal Fear once. Uh, I think I think it was while you were away. Uh, it was at Prague Power USA, like in two thousand nine. I never I think. played Prague Power. No, okay. I never played it. It was the well, the, the time period when, when I was not in. Oh, okay. I guess right. I think that Henny played there. I guess Henny and Stefan. I guess. And I think yeah, Pamela Moore was there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was in two thousand nine. I remember that. Okay, maybe Alex was in there. I I don't have a clue to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Neither do I. I had a lot of beer that weekend. <laughs> it would be nice to play the the pro power. Maybe we can do this again next year or so. Oh yeah, yeah. You guys are huge there. The fans love you. Yeah, and you have to check out the seventy thousand tons of metal cruise. This is awesome. Yes, yes. That is on my list. I did it twice. I did it, it was the second time this year and. It's just a blast, man, to to meet all the guys from different bands and you hang out with with fans and you're on the cruise and you go to whatever, in Jamaica or Turk Islands and just enjoy and relax. It's so fucking amazing. You really have to do it once in your life. You know, when the waters are rough, like, d- does it ever get difficult performing if the waters are too rough? Um, I had, like, some kind of experience when I played and you know, things like, and the boat was, like, going left, right, left, and you make a step, and you're like, oh, mm-hmm. it feels like you're drunk a little bit, but <laughs> normally it's, it's, it was, it's all cool. It's really a huge, a huge boat. It's like, wow, this is like 15 floors or 16 floors and three meters, 300 meters long, and, you know, the, the first time I was there, I just saw Alex when, when I met him on stage because it's so huge and everybody's hanging around somewhere and talking to Pretty Mate or Destruction or Annihilator or, or how many bands there are there on the boat. It's like unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Just hang out and you can watch other bands play and having a drink and you don't have to drive home afterwards, so it's very relaxed. That That is exactly where I want to go. Sure. That's One day. One day. Good. Cool. All right, Tom. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Absolutely. You have a good night, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Primal Fear guitarist Tom Newman, ladies and gentlemen. What a cool dude. You know, I've chatted with a lot of musicians I admire over the years, and almost all of them have been super cool people, but I can honestly say that Tom is one of the most sincere and gentle and down-to-earth rockers I've ever had the pleasure of chatting with. Really cool dude, and I definitely look forward to hanging out with him whenever Primal Fear hits the road. Primal Fear's new album is called Apocalypse, and it'll be online and in stores on August 10th via Frontiers Music. There's a lot of package deals available that include CDs and DVDs and T-shirts and 180-gram gatefold LPs for all you collectors out there. Anyway, do remember to subscribe to our podcast to get notified of all our interviews and find us and like us on the Facebooks and the Twitters as well. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube and, of course, you have to check out sonicperspectives.com where you're going to find a plethora of album reviews, interviews, photo galleries, news, and other cool stuff. Anyway, this is Gonzo the Unpronounceable signing off once again, and I'm going to leave you this time with a cut from the new Primer Fear album. This song is called Hounds of Justice.
fantastic